Okay. Welcome to the Morgan County Commission meeting. Today is December 5th, 2023. We welcome all those who are in attendance here in our uh, in person and those who are joining us online. We will begin with an invocation and pledge of allegiance from Commissioner McCall. Our Father in heaven, we're grateful this time for the opportunity we have to come before thee on this December evening. We're grateful for the opportunity to meet together as a commission and for those members of the public who have joined us this evening. We're grateful for uh, the blessings of living in a free country and for uh, the opportunities and privileges that it affords us. We pray for those who are struggling throughout the world with uh, difficulties that arise by a wide variety of reasons and pray thy blessings to be upon them. We pray that thou would be with us this night that we might enjoy wisdom and judgment in the decisions we make and we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much, Commissioner McConnell. Uh, we will move to item B on our agenda. Uh, we have one consent item this evening, and that is the review and approval of the minutes from our tw November 21st, 2023 meeting. I gave her, I gave Julie some comments on it and uh, some wrong statements, but anyway, the rest of you, I don't know what you've got. I didn't have any notes. Okay. I move that we that we <laughs> that we accept the minutes from the November twenty first meeting, twenty twenty three. Second. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. Thank you. Uh, declarations of conflict of interest. Um, for any commissioner on any items on tonight's agenda. So, with respect to the item number, action item number two, I don't represent the developer of that project, but I do represent one of the water companies in the area. I guess that would be relevant for item number five as well. Okay. All right. We will move to item D, which is our public comment period. And this is an opportunity for the public to address the commission. Uh, we do have one budget, uh, excuse me, one hearing item this evening, and that is our budget hearing um, item G. The rest of the items are action items, so this would be the opportunity for the public to address the commission. <laughs> Commissioner Newton. Yes. Before you begin, I mean with this, I we need to make sure that they speak directly into the mic because listening online, you do not hear what they're saying. Okay. Okay. Yeah, if you'll just speak dress, directly into the mic and state your name for us. You mean what it says right here? <laughs> Yep. <laughs> not quite tall enough. Can you, can you Feel free to adjust okay? that if you want. If it's, <laughs> yeah, so you don't have to stand enough? on your tippy toes. There you go. Okay, so my name is Allie Archibald. And um, this is in regard to the conflict of interest. I just, um, I have paperwork here that is proof that the law firm that McConnell works for sent a protest into the state stopping Highlands from being able to serve Lee's Market. Yet tonight he's going to propose to make an amendment to the at risk permit for Lee's to move forward without a water company as his client works on their certification. I believe that this is, what he stated is, is one, unethical, and two, that it is a very major conflict and that to even be asked to be doing this, I don't feel is okay. Thank you. My name is Marjorie Smith, and um, I send all of you uh, 
an email today. I don't know if you got it, but um, it it came about because I, I, I attended the commission meeting on September 7th or 5th, whatever it was, and um, heard the information about, um, or the discussion about the um, Lee's Market being able to start putting in some underground uh, things so that they could beat the weather. And uh, it seemed pretty clear that it was all just underground, that they weren't going to be going vertical. And then, um, so I was surprised it not too long ago to see vertical uh, lines going up on the up there. So I, I went back and listened to that meeting, and then I listened to the next meeting to see if there had been um, something else added at that next meeting. And anyway, that's why I listened to the meetings. And as I did, I, I, I kind of became a little frustrated because I kept hearing that um, there were no approved water companies that would present, a, that would give Lease Market a, a will serve letter. And I knew that um, we had been approached three times by Zach Swenson to provide a will serve, and three times we'd been willing to provide the will serve letter. Um, they, they would he would come and ask, and then and we'd say this, and and anyway he didn't follow through. So then we didn't just felt like they didn't want one. So anyway, it's it's not because um, we were unwilling that we that we they didn't we didn't give them a, a will serve letter, but. Um, it just seemed like the impression from the discussions and comments um, left the impression that there was a big problem with water companies in Mountain Green, and and uh, and one of the comments was even they you know wish we could make one of the water companies serve Lees, and yet we were vil willing at that very moment to serve Lees, and we spoke to Brian Stevenson right after that first September meeting, and and assured him that we would be willing to provide water if they wanted. Um, Lee's Market has chosen to go with uh, the new proposed water company and um, and to wait for them to become approved and that's fine um, but it it just is interesting that they keep needing exceptions um, asking for exceptions at, anyway so I just felt like anyway as I went through that I just felt like I needed to make some corrections to things that were said there was discussion about um, our service area and that there were overlapping service areas and um, I, and I have documentation I put it in your email you may not have even had a chance to read that because I said it this afternoon but uh, but that area was certified into our service area back in 1976 and so by the certified by the Public Service Commission so it's not just it's not just that I'm trying to like swoop it up now and say oh that's our, our service area. It was certified back in 1976, uh, adopted into our service area. And so for whatever that means, and I know that, that there have been, you know, there is controversy about, about service areas. The Public Service Commission has told me multiple times that while we're regulated by the Public Service Commission, so they do keep track of our service area, but mutual companies just serve their own customers and so they don't really have a service area but um, however that comes out that's whatever that is that's fine um, I, I just had one more clarification in your letter that um, Highlands Water Company is not precluded from serving the property because of a settlement agreement with Dwayne Johnson that's a, an interpretation that I feel is is um, erroneous <laughs> So and that wasn't brought up in the meetings, but it's just something that been, that's been said, and maybe you've heard it. So, anyway, I just want to be clear that we're it, we're not insisting that we serve Lee's Market at all. We just knew that they needed water, and um, we were we were able to to provide water. We have pipes that go on three sides of that project. And we were kind of anxious not to have other water lines crossing our water lines that can sometimes cause problems. But we do serve the bank on the one side and the dentist office on the other, and we serve Rome across the street. So anyway, we we could and would issue a will serve letter to Lee's Market, 
they have chosen to uh, go with the proposed water company and that's fine we are not trying to force anyone to go with our water we have plenty of people that need that need water but um, as I listened to that it just I just felt like I wanted to clarify that and um, so that's what I'm doing tonight thank you thank you Seeing no additional public comment, we will move to item E, which is a presentation from Boundary Line Surveying on a report for the recorder's office. <laughs> Not me. <laughs> we'll see if Jeremy can. started. Hello commissioners, thank you for your time tonight. Um, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Devron Anderson and uh, I am a professional licensed land surveyor. Um, I, I run a survey company called Boundary Line Surveying, but I kind of stepped away from surveying for a few years to serve as a, the elected county recorder in Cache County. <clears throat> so uh, I, I appreciate the opportunity to be able to um, come down at your invitation and, and take a look at the recorder's office and, and issue this report. Um, I. I'm not going to show the report tonight. I will uh, send that to you digitally, and I'm happy to follow up with any one of you if you have any questions. Um, but before reading the report, I thought it would be good to walk through with you guys for a couple minutes and maybe take your understanding of the recorder's office and what it does from a you know 120,000 level maybe down to a 30,000 level, um, just to kind of help you understand what that office does exactly and. and Kind of get a good idea of what the workflow is there, um, and then the report should make more sense. Is that okay with you guys? Okay. So, um, the county recorder's offices across the state are, are very, very similar. Um, they all function in similar ways. They all deal with the same laws. They all deal with the same types of documents. They're just geographically located by um, by counties, but each recorder's office can be kind of broken into three separate parts. There's document recording that happens, document processing, and parcel mapping. So we're gonna talk about those three things in specific. Um, one thing to note about the recorder's office, it has not changed. It's been very, very much the same office and done the same functions for uh, lots of years. I've got a reference here to the, the original uh, laws that were put in place by the state of Deseret where they set up the recorder's office in each county and they uh, designated that office for this purpose of recording uh, documents that deal with land records. Um, but let's jump to document recording. Um, document recording is the it's the baseline for everything the recorder's office does. If there was no documents recorded, the recorder's office would do nothing. We only react to documents that get recorded. Um, there's three different ways that documents get recorded, and these days, by far, the, the biggest way that documents get recorded is they get digitally um, recorded, um, electronically recorded. There's no interaction between the recorder's office and the people doing the recording. Um, they still do accept recordings over the counter, and they still do accept recordings in the mail and process all of those. Um, something that I think is important to understand about the recorder's office is when a document meets all of the recording requirements that are established by state code, it is entitled to be recorded. The recorder's office can't stop it if it meets all the recording requirements that are set up by, by state code. Um, once a document meets those recording requirements, uh, it is entitled to be recorded. The recorder's office uh, has to record that. 
Uh, there's an example of a recorder stamp there that gets uh, stamped on the document. And from that point forward, it's public record. It can't be altered, removed, changed, or any of the information in that document um, obliterated or altered in any way. So that's the first step to the recorder's office is that document recording. Any questions about that? I know there's a lot of people over the years that have asked me, well, why doesn't the recorder's office stop this from happening? And the answer is, well, when documents have all the required requirements to be recorded, we have to record them. That, that's not, the recorder's office isn't the sheriff of what can get recorded, what can um, state code is. All right, um, so once the document's recorded, it gets scanned and put into the system. Um, I think that's probably the extent of what the public thinks about the, the recorder's office, but there's a whole bunch of back-end work that happens behind the scenes um, with these documents after they get recorded. Um, in fact, state code lists just a, a whole bunch of different indexes that the, the county recorder's office has to maintain. Um, those indexes are, are required so that people can find those documents in the future. Um, for all kinds of different reasons people would need to find those documents, but the recorder's office has to keep them in individual um, indexes. They also have to do um, what's called a, do a legal description verification. So every document that gets recorded in the recorder's office has to be tied to land, well, nearly all the documents have to be tied to land. That's the whole purpose of the recorder's office, is dealing with documents that are tied to the land. So every single document has to have a legal description on it when it gets recorded. If that legal description matches word for word with the legal description that's already on record, then there's a, a process called a direct transfer that we process those documents through. If the descriptions don't match, even by one word or one foot or whatever, they have to go through a different process. We have to evaluate what happened and why it's different. So there's quite a different process depending on if that, that legal description matches or not. Um, unfortunately, there's no technology that can do that for us. It's still a very laborsome, uh, tedious process to look character for character at every, every part of that legal description to make sure they match. Have any of you had the opportunity to try to read through a legal description before your own property? Sometimes they're simple, you know, all of lot three of whatever subdivision, but sometimes they can be page after page of, of calls and, and distances and bearings that can get uh, hard to deal with. So and depending on the document, that process can take a long time. Um, once the documents go through that process, um, the ones that become straight transfers or direct transfers, they get, they get fully processed at that point. And something that I think a lot of people have a hard time with is the recorder's office has to decide or make a, a determination whether that document meets the requirements established by code to be legally sufficient to do what it's intending to do. Um, sometimes documents look like everything's right, but the wrong person signed the document. Well, in that case, it's not going to do what it's supposed to do because it has to have the, 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 right, the correct people signing that document. Um, so that's just one instance. Um, but every single document has to be reviewed by the recorder's office and a determination has to be made whether that document will pass title or do what it's intended to do or not. Um, so. In those processes, that takes time, if you can imagine, uh, when there's many documents that get recorded in a day and, and in a week, those processes can take some time. Um, any questions about document processing and what the recorder's office does there? Okay. Um, the last part of the recorder's office, what they do uh, that's uh, incredibly important is they they're the trigger for the beginning of the property tax system. And they are the trigger for that because they map the parcels um, for all of these documents. Um, so every time a document changes land ownership, the recorder's office has to go into the maps and remove the old name and put the new name on. They make those changes on those maps. Uh, this is a requirement by state code that, that the 
Corps office keep those maps and maintain them uh, with the current owners, the current uh, dimensions, and that includes uh, parcel numbers and acreage too. So a lot of documents that get processed in the recorder's office actually do make changes to the property. And that is a pretty labor intensive process for someone to read through that document, map out the description, compare what the new description's doing to the old descriptions and figure out what's, what's happening where. How, what does this document affect? Does it affect just this property or this property and the next property? All that information has to be worked out in the mapping uh, of these properties in, in the course office. And so if you can imagine a subdivision plat that has many, you know, dozens of lots, it can take some time for the recorder's office to work through exactly where those lots are, what parcel they came from, and creating those parcels in the system, it can, it can take some time. Any questions with, with that aspect or what the recorder's office does there? Okay. Um, one thing, as I mentioned before, the recorder's office is the start of the property tax collection system. On January 30th of every year, the recorder's office has to give all changes that have happened in the previous year up to December 31st, or I think the code technically says uh, January 1st. All changes that happened in the previous year, the recorder's office has to pass those to the assessor's office so that they can then go assess those values and start collecting those taxes on those properties. Um, in addition to that year end, we call it the year end uh, deadline that we have to do is starting in August and every month after August, the recorder's office has to get updated changes to the assessor's office on a monthly basis. Um, that way the assessor has time to work in those and get uh, tax notices to the proper people. So those are the state mandated uh, deadlines that the recorder's office is under and it's it's a pretty simple equation. There's documents coming in, manpower to process them, and those deadlines. So if there's too many documents coming in, the only part of the equation that can be adjusted is the manpower and their productivity to meet those deadlines. So um, it can be a volatile system. Uh, there are times like in uh, 2021 where every recorder's office in the state was just getting hammered with more documents than they'd ever had before. Um, so at times there needs to be some flexibility with the ability of the recorder's office to maybe get more help or get more people to get uh, more of these documents processed when they have big rushes like that. Can I ask a quick question on that, Debron? Um, I know with other departments at times when we've had struggles to keep up with the demand that we've looked at third party and even having a, I don't even know if you, I guess you'd call it a firm, but a third party firm that would have the ability to help when called on. Um, I'm not as familiar with the recorder's office and if there's that ability out there, have, have, have you seen an ability like that for the recorder's office? You know, I would say that there are parts of the process that possibly could be done that way. Um, I definitely think there's parts of the mapping or, or the figuring out what the part, what the documents do to the parcels. You know what parcels they affect and what ones they don't. I think there are parts of that that probably could, um, but I would say probably 60, 70 percent of what the recorder's office does. There's not any other office or any other companies in the title industry or the engineering industry or any other industry that do exactly what they do. So it, it is very important, and I put this in my report, some of my recommendations. I think it's very important that the recorder's office train multiple employees, cross-train them to do the same job so that if one's gone or if one quits, we're not left in a spot where it's gonna take months and months to retrain someone to do this job, but nobody's ever been trained to do. Does that make sense? So did that answer your question? I think. Yeah. I think there are parts that possibly could um, be contracted out, but but not the whole process that I'm aware of. And there's definitely parts that shouldn't be or wouldn't be logical to contract out. Good question. All right, just one thing to 
that I want to point out about the recorder's office is a little bit different than the other offices in the county because the recorder's office by state code is required to charge a recording fee. And it is a service fee that is supposed to go to 100% the reason why that fee is collected, right? Fees are different than taxes because fees have to um, go to the reason why we're collecting that fee. Um, in some counties, the fees they collect for recording far outnumber the costs of doing the recording work. Um, in other counties, and I believe this is the case here, the fees help but don't cover all the costs of the recorder's office. And so um, the state auditor's been pretty clear on this, that fees shouldn't be collected in excess of what you can do, but um, but the general fund can, can make up the difference when the fees don't cover all of the cost. So just something to be aware of when you're dealing with the recorder's office that it, it does generate a good, good amount of uh, income from its fees for recording purposes. And again, that's not something the recorder can make adjustments to or change that step set by state code. Um, okay, I'm gonna just skip through this uh, quickly. Some of the things that state code mandates the recorder's office do, um, I've listed in the report, but there are lots of things that aren't mandated by state code, but just make a lot of common sense. Um, one of those things would be uh, using computer-aided technology to draft and map uh, the parcels and the maps that are required to be uh, maintained um, rather than doing those by hand. Um, that's one, one way in which every recorder's office can become more productive and uh, become more accurate for the people is to have their computer-aided drafting. It's kind of similar to um, using a typewriter versus using Microsoft Word. There's just a huge difference in what you can do and the accuracy of what you're doing and the look of it when you uh, go to a digital uh, mapping process and map things digitally. Um, right now, there are parts of the recorder's office workflow that is done with a type of um, computer-aided drafting, but there's other parts that are still being done by hand. So uh, one of the recommendations in the report will, that I would recommend is to try to get to uh, get a program and get to a place where everybody's trained to be able to map all the parts of the reporter's office process with, with digital uh, technology. Um, something else that can be done uh, to help any recorder's office is to uh, move to software that can create a digital workflow. Um, when I started, my work at Cache County as the recorder there, um, they were using folders and they were printing every document, putting them in folders, passing them around. Um, sometimes those documents would get stuck on somebody's desk because they were behind on work and it kind of made a big bottleneck to the system. Um, there was one document that somebody had handed to me at some point during 2021 and I found it about five months later it had never been processed it was sitting underneath something on my desk uh, so there's opportunities for error when you don't use technology to help you when, when it's available uh, one thing that most recorders offices have done and, and that I think would be beneficial here would be to move to a, a system whether it's created in-house or purchased from a third party would be to uh, move to a computer system that can handle a digital workflow and track these documents so that they don't get lost or misplaced or done out of order. And all of that information can be available in the computer system. Um, and, and I think that that's something that anybody would want to do in a recorder's office. I think the big hurdle there is usually the cost and getting the budget to make that kind of a change and getting the training to be able to use a system. Um, I'll just skip through uh, that one, but uh, another important aspect of the recorder's office is they, they have documents that are hundreds of years old, and the longer these documents sit because of the ink, because of the poor attempts to preserve them in the past with tape put on them and different items like that, um, those documents will fade and will deteriorate over time it's the responsibility of the recorder's office to maintain those documents. Um, and 
And so getting those documents preserved, getting them to a point where they stop deteriorating is something that's possible, um, but it, it takes money and effort to do that. And so uh, in that process and preserving these documents, it's also pretty important and a pretty critical job to get them imaged, to get them digital, so that they can then be uh, delivered to the public in a digital format. Um, I think currently there's quite a few uh, different sets of records and documents in the reporter's office that you can only see if you go there because they haven't been imaged and made available to them. So. Any questions with that? That was just kind of a kind of a brief overview, but I kind of wanted to run through that and give you an idea of kind of the workflow of a reporter's office, how that works. Um, I'll be sending you a digital version of my report, and then I'd be happy to come and follow up with you on one-on-one -on -one or, or in another meeting if you have any questions or not. So you had the couple of slides back. It indicated that on a monthly basis, the recorder transmits ownership changes to the assessor's office. Yes, in the, but in then the second half of the year. Oh, that okay. I see. It's September to December. That's what I wasn't picking. Yeah. So until August fifteenth, they just they don't necessarily provide them on a monthly basis. But by August fifteenth, for the first seven months, they provide them, and then thereafter, it's monthly. Yeah. And, and really, this is a little bit of an antiquated code. Um, this code was written back in the day when they literally had to make copies of the maps and hand them over to the, the assessor's office. Um, I think a year or two ago, the assessor's group had talked about maybe changing this code to say that every month there needed to be updated information given from the recorder's office because that information now is in the computer systems and it's easier to make that available. Um, I, I don't know exactly how the system here works, but I know where I worked at Cache County. The day we made the changes, that was available for the assessor to see. They could go in and see every change we made on a daily basis. So, And then did it like generate a report on a monthly basis, or was the assessor just charged with going in on a daily basis to see what the changes are. Yeah, they had tools in the in the computer system that would alert them when changes, had, like if a new parcel was created or a parcel was changed significantly by size or shape, it would alert them and give them the parcel number and they would go in and look at the changes and put it on their list to reassess those properties. So yeah, that's, that's all stuff that can be built into these computer systems that can help in these processes. But barring or not having those computer processes, this is the, the standard, this is the code that has to be Good question. So what kind of <clears throat> software do you recommend that we look into? You know, I could probably spend about three hours here talking to you about different softwares. There's there's many options out there. It's a, it's a free market when you're talking about third-party vendors. Um, I know some of the bigger counties have opted to build their own software and, and make it more personalized to what they do. Um, but there's there's three major places where the recorder's office needs software. Um, they need software that can print or endorse the documents and keep track of those entry numbers. Um, they need software that can hold all the information for the parcels and for the owners of who owns parcels. And then they're going to need software to draft those maps and create those parcel maps that they're so there's multiple different options. I don't think there's any one answer that you would have to go here or there. I have my recommendations, ones that I'm accustomed to, but you might have uh, somebody in your reporter's office that's more accustomed to one of the other ones and might be able to use that more efficiently than, than using mine, so. Well, we're trying, to, we're trying to find the best thing possible to help the recorder. Sure. And so I'm hoping in your report you can at least give us something of some recommendations then we can go to the recorder and ask her what she would like and then we can do our research into what we need to do uh, because we all know and, and she knows I hope that we're trying to help her for sure because we need to yeah yeah you know that's the the beautiful thing about a county that's functioning properly with professionals that are in each office is you can function very well as a team and, and work together. So, yeah, I, I didn't mention specific programs in my report, but if I just mentioned um, pr 
processes that I think could be updated to improve uh, the workflow, but I'd be happy to follow up anytime with a, a discussion more in depth on, on the specific programs and what they can do and what they can't do. Okay, any, any additional questions? No, I just, just appreciate you taking your time and I, I know in talking with Brenda, um, our recorder, you know, I think she had so many things that she wanted to get done and, and be voiced and be understood. And, um, you know, I've been in my career for 20 plus years and just what you showed me tonight, half of this stuff is new to me. So I, I think a recorder's office is very specific and on what they do and unique and not many see that. And so I think back to what Commissioner Facco was saying of, of helping, uh, I think it'll be a, a great help and just appreciate you taking the time and look forward to working with, with Brenda and getting this report out. For sure. If I may, one, uh, just some parting words. I was really impressed with the, the amount of time and, and the effort that the recorder's office and Brenda and her staff went to, to to help me understand their processes and how their workflows are and they were very accommodating. They're a really good group, so I'm, I hope that some of the things I can express in the report will benefit you guys and, and it can move forward for Morgan County in general. So thank you. Thank you, Dovron. Okay, we will move to our action items. Action item number one, Aaron Bott. This is a discussion, decision, request for approval to replace the Mountain Green Outdoor Book Return. Yes. Julie, if you can skip back a couple to that picture of the current Mountain Green Outdoor Book Return. I wanted to include this because it shows you not only what we're talking about, but why we're talking about it. It is in rough shape and needs to be replaced. Um, we do have the money in our budget in our services not otherwise classified line. Um, I did get three bids for a replacement return, the same model that will fit on the existing concrete pad. And I would just like permission to buy the cheapest one. Is that the TLS? Is that it the is one? It's the library store, TLS. What's the difference between that and a regular mailbox? I don't actually know. <laughs> I've never tried to purchase a regular mailbox. I was going to say, back in the day, I used to collect them all the time from, you know, those nice wonderful things we open up and put it into it. and I don't think they're that expensive but you could look into them do see they, if it would work are they weatherproof and do they have inside where they have like the spring loaded shelf so that it'll it'll go down as it gets heavier and more full they do have some of those but you'll have to just look and figure it out I could potentially look but I would look at that um, you know I'm not I'm wondering about the capacity of a mailbox you and can I could certainly look into it I honestly never thought of that yeah but just just look around maybe at that I mean we can accept this or we can just accept the fact that maybe you're gonna look for another one that's less expensive even though you've got it in the budget um, I just personally I I have looked into them before back in the day and I don't know what they are now so you can look into them It appears to me that these are a little different from a mailbox in the, the way they collect the books to yeah. not damage the books. I think so. There but, is additional uh, padding. I don't in know. There. They're not much different. But I would look into them, just me personally. So if I was to a recommendation is that we approve the fact that she needs to get one and approve that and then let her go and look for anything if there's anything less that will do the same job and if not to accept that low bid so if you want to make that a is that a motion that would be a motion if i can do that so okay i'll second we have a motion and a second all those in favor Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner McConnell seconded. 
Okay, uh, item number two, Commissioner McConnell. So this is, I'm passing along a request, so let me be specific in terms of the entities that I represent, or our firm represents. Mountain Green Mutual Water Company is the newly created entity that is seeking approval from the division uh, to operate as a mutual water company. On behalf of that entity, my, fi my firm has filed objections to the recent pleadings with the Highlands by the Highlands Water Company before the Public Service Commission. I, this request came to two of us. I agreed to send it along to the commission for evaluation and a decision. Some have suggested that that's unethical for me to do. I generally pass along all requests from applicants that I receive, and this is no exception. With respect to disclosures of public, uh, of conflicts of interest, the rule is that I must disclose if I'm a public officer, a public em employee, uh, and if I'm an officer, director, agent, employee, or owner of a substantial interest in any business entity that is subject to the regulation of the agency by which the public officer or public employee is employed. I, I don't define employee. I'm not technically on the payroll of any of those entities, but I've always assumed that employee is broad enough to include legal representation by my firm, and that's why I disclose those conflicts of interest. It does not require recusal insofar as I'm aware, <laughs> and unless the rules have changed. Um, I do represent Ruling Gardner's various entities. He does not have an interest that I'm aware of in the Lee's Marketplace development. That is owned by Mr. Johnson, and I think technically through an entity that he calls uh, Sutterby. I did work for Sutterby a number of years ago, probably five or six years ago, but I have no ongoing representation of that entity. Ruling Gardner's entities, I can't remember which one, does have property, own property in that area as well, and he has participated in the cost of developing a million gallon tank and several wells on the property, and that's where the interest in Mountain Green Mutual Water Company comes from, as well as another entity called Mountain Green Tank, which I believe technically owns the tank and leases it to Mountain Green Mutual Water Company. I have in the past been on the board for Cottonwood Mutual Water Company. I was on the board when Cottonwood Mutual Water Company was asked to um, expand its service area to include this area. And my recollection is that the vote, um, the board did vote to expand their service area to include this area. I think that arose out of conflicts and disagreements between Mr. Johnson and the the family that owns um, the Highlands Water Company. I'm, I won't speak to those because I don't have enough information about them to speak intelligently about them. So I've passed along the request. The request is um, that they be allowed to do the CMU blocking under the current at-risk building permit. I'll also point out that I think there was an email from Chief Brendel of the Mountain Green uh, Fire District indicating that he didn't have concerns from a fire health and safety um, perspective with respect to allowing the CMU. It's not flammable material. I have a question for you. Um, We don't allow other companies or other entities to build upward without having a water permit or a will serve by a company. And even though this one, Mountain Green Mutual Water Company, is not fully or been given um, a go ahead to have water yet, even though they own or they have interest in that well of Dwayne Johnson. I don't think we should move forward 
until after they do the same thing that anybody else has to do in this county and they have to have water whether or not it's steel wood plastic whatever they want to build hay straw whatever kind of building if they don't have that will serve i don't think we should go forward at this point which means it'd be a cease uh, they'd have to stop so i that's just my opinion because once we start one we're going to have to do it to everybody if I want to build a metal building and, you know, live in it, if I'm going to put, if I have water available, then I can get a permit. If I don't have water available, according to our code, I cannot. So, I mean, if we're going to do it, we either change the law or we wait until they get ready. Is there an... I mean, they've already done the part they needed to for the winter, which we gave them that uh, horizontal permit. Now they're going upward, even though it's not flammable, unless somebody came along with a super hot wa uh, fire. I just, you know, sure, the metal is going to still stay there, even in a fire, but I still wonder what's going to happen if all of a sudden we start doing this and we don't, we have thwarted our own code. Now, am I, is the code state that they have to have water before they build? Yes, our code states that. But um, my understanding, I wasn't at the meeting when the ordinance was approved under state code. So state code allows a county to put an ordinance in effect for up to six months, granting things, granting, I guess you would say, um, permissions that aren't allowed in our county code so that's what happened back whenever the initial ordinance was passed allowing the horizontal at-risk construction um, if so so based on this request it's not allowed under our current code and we have to go back through that same process um, I don't know if the analysis would change though based on representations made tonight that maybe there is a water company available or, you know, that changes because when the decision was initially made, the commission was under the impression that there wasn't available water. And so I think that that added, or at least was a basis for finding a compelling countervailing public interest under the Utah code that allows the county to put temporary ordinances in place. So basically then, if we want the, to be able to do that, we need to change the code before we go and do this. Is that correct? Well, it sounds like it could be done under a, under a uh, resolution, right? It would have a temporary to, resolution. Um, it would have to be a new temporary ordinance under the state code gotcha. that allows us to do that, expanding the scope, because the current ordinance doesn't allow it. And I personally, I mean, I support the project 100%, mm -hmm. but given the fact that originally it was only the horizontal work, now we're talking going vertical, which was kind of the cutoff in that discussion previously, and given the fact that whether they intend to use another water company or not, we've been told that there is potential to use another water company should they decide to, I personally agree I don't I don't think we should proceed with that I think they need to work out the water situation yeah I, you know you do need water um, and, and I agree with the will serve I've seen all kinds of acceptance acceptances to things like this I've seen footing and foundation go you know the foundation can be six feet three feet eight feet out of the ground um, vertical only if flammable that that's not allowed because you have to have water to fight that in case there's a fire. So vertical with CMU is a little bit different. I do agree where we continue to move forward without a viable, I guess you could say, water company in place that could that could give a wheel surf. I've seen developments come in and they say, and, and the, the closest water company says, yeah, we'll serve it but they're going to have to build a tank, they're going to have to put in all the infrastructure, and yeah, we can serve it. And, and that's part of the agreements and part of the process. So I've actually seen it where 
water hasn't been available at the time, but there's agreements in place to, to get it there. Um, I, I don't know. I, I agree with what Garrett said earlier. Um, I, I think when it was presented, we did not know that there were other options. I, I did not know that. I didn't know there were other water companies out there that said, yes, we'll, we'll serve. Um, so I, so th that does come into play. Um, so I don't know. I, I, I don't think we can continue to stretch this out. I think we were under the impression with this new water company that it was going to be done fairly soon. Um, if that's within a couple months, um, that would feel much better. If it's a year from now, that would not feel very good. So I don't know. Yeah, and it hasn't been done yet, as far as I'm, I know. It has not been completed, and that was over two months ago. So it's been almost three months. Talking with the Public Service Commission the other day, um, I have found out that, you know, this company could make it through and they are member owned. We don't know what the members are. Um, and right now the Public Service Commission says, you know, one, there is one company that could supply them the water. And they do have that. And it has been in place. That is their service area. But Lee's Market decided not to use them for some reason or another. And I know that reason, um, at least partially. And Robert can tell me whether or not it is or isn't. I don't know. You don't know it. Um, but it's basically because Wayne Johnson is a partner. Of the, he's, he's become a partner in the Lee's market. Yeah, regardless, I think, I think we've got to have some kind of something. We can't, I, I don't think it's be prudent for us just to say, hopefully it works out. We'll see. I, I even think we had that concern last time when we, we approved it because we understood that it was going to be done fairly quickly. Yeah, I think we tried to move forward in good faith, um, but I, I feel like we can only do that so long before we're... So That's just my thoughts. Just, to, just so you're aware, they do have water at the hydrant for fire suppression. That's through Cottonwood Mutual Water Company and a separate agreement with respect to that. But they do not have a will serve letter from Cottonwood Mutual Water Company. I have a question for Ms. Smith if she's willing to answer. Up here. We need you in the, on the speaker. You have a water tank on, and or a combination of water tanks, and I don't know their exact capacity, is it? 485,000 gallons is a number I've heard, but I have no idea 1. what that's right. 1.2 million. 1.2 million. The distribution lines from those tanks, what what are they down to for fire flow protection? They're, they're a combination of, um, they're, they're different sizes that come down from the tanks. Um, we do have, I mean, I it'd be hard to say exactly I could show a picture, uh, I could give you a picture of what the, the line sizes are, but I can tell you that we have sufficient fire flow for the area and we are also in the process, it was started some time ago to increase some of the pipe sizes that will um, give us even, even better fire flow for that area that line will be installed in the spring. We have the design, our engineers have been designing it and, and getting things. So ready. in terms of the gravity flow portion of your system, mm -hmm. is there, are there portions of that distribution line that are only six inch pipe? Um, yes, there are. And I could have Nate come up and he's my operator and he could tell you more about those lines. Hadley, I'm the system operator. I also live in the county. And we have our SCADA system is set up that in that low zone where Lee's Market and everything along Old Highway, if a hydrant is opened up for a fire flow situation, our well, which is fairly close to this area, will kick on and deliver water. And that's a, there's a, from, a, from the well to the just south of the Cottonwood Creek is a 14 inch line, and then it turns to a 10 inch that goes all the way out to Old Highway and surrounds this whole project. 
So for portion for purposes of this lower area, then your fire suppression flows are dependent upon the well and the, the pump well and, and the, the SCADA system operating at the time. Mm -hmm. Okay. And add the gravity feed from the tanks as well. So that which would be supplemental to the yeah. what's done from SCADA. Okay, thank you. And real real quick, Nate, I'm sure you've done a test. Well, you had to do a test on the well. What what can it produce? Just for the record, you know what it can produce well the last time they did it they've done it three times in the last couple of years but they did it twice for rome and it was around 1500 gallons a minute and when their engineers model showing when all the lines for rome are in it'll be around 17 thank you do you know what it runs if the pump system is not operating the, like if the well is not operating mm -hmm. from that the last time when we didn't run the well at that the hydrant right there at the church on Old Highway, the they call the Highlands Building Chapel. Mm -hmm. It was over a thousand gallons a minute. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Do we have a motion on this item, or any any additional discussion? Josh, do you have something you want to comment? Yeah, yeah, that'd be great, actually. Dave, you want to come? Yeah, I didn't really prepare anything like about last, last minute, but um, any questions you have, I'll be happy to answer. Um, we're, we're, I thought we discussed this in the previous, but you're still doing inspections. That is correct. On this, on this structure. Right. Okay. Right. Um, the uh, my understanding, well, and I, I, sp I uh, spoke with um, the contractor, and they showed me the document that said they were allowed to do uh, the steel vertically, um, and so. I didn't stop them at that point. Um, the contractor also told me that they would be uh, done with they they'd be done with CMU up to the top of foundation level um, this week. Um, they were talking about sending people home, um, which I mean, I'm, I'm not advocating one way or the other. The thing that the thing that concerns me, though, is um, you know we we've heard we've heard the talk of this new water company, um, but wouldn't they have to put in? I mean, the the lines to to provide water, and you know how long how long will that take? I, I don't know. Um, my concern, my concern mainly is if they're allowed to continue, it's, it's more money out of the pocket of the market they have on the line with, on, with the potential of not being to open at their target date. So um, I would feel better if there was something a little more solid. And we do, um, you know, we do, uh, it's not uncommon to do uh, temporary permits um, waiting on waiting on the presence of water, um, but usually, um, you know, the water, you know, they're waiting to put in a pipeline or finish a tank or something like that. It's not that they have, you know, formed a company to provide the service. Any questions for Dave? Okay. Is there a representative of Lee's here? Would you like to address anything that's been discussed thus far? Yeah, I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Um, so Zach Swenson, um, I've seen all of your faces several times before, representing Lee's project. Um, just wanted to speak to a few things 
the original at-risk ordinance that was approved that did include steel erection um, with the express approval with, from Chief Brendel, um, which Chief Brendel was willing to provide. Um, so, so as far as steel erection goes, we, we weren't operating outside of the scope of that original permit. We, we are well aware um, and, and stopped CMU or at foundation. We just stopped at foundation because we knew that it was outside of our scope. The inclusion or the proposal to include CMU blocking um, is just because it, it allows for um, a reduction in cold weather costs um, for a lot of the subfloor utilities, plumbing, etc. cetera. Um, once the snow really sets in, it, it's, it's good to have um, a walled off area where you, where you don't get wind, etc. cetera. Um, so th that's essentially why we've proposed it. We are still not done with the um, utility improvements, the right-of-way improvements that are approved under the scope of that um, temporary ordinance. We've done sewer. Um, storm water was finished as of this week and water is scheduled to be um, installed. The water lines scheduled to be installed this, this next week. So that is still in process. We're not, we're not done with that scope. Um, that being said, um, RNO, our contractor, has kind of reached the point where um, um, they may have to pull off the job if, if we um, don't give, continue to give them scope or, or work that they can do. And so that's why we had proposed what we proposed. Um, as far as the comments made by Highland um, representatives, I, I appreciate Marjorie. She's been great to talk with. Um, as you know, the project, Lee's project, is part of the Mountain Green Village Development Agreement. It's around 100 acres of land that was approved as a development agreement in 2014. Um, so when it comes down to making decisions for water providers, etc., it's a little bit more complex and nuanced than just, hey, we have one water provider that can service the lease parcel only. Um, um, our project and our plat encompasses, um, I want to say it's 15 acres, I, I, need to, I don't know the exact number, we just make up four acres, um, our partnership. And so we've partnered with Dwayne Johnson, um, the Badger family, the Lee's Marketplace family, um, the Stoke Stevenson family, and um, Dwayne Johnson have partnered just on one parcel. That's the only parcel for which we have any say, any control, and so decisions um, when it comes to long-term water providers, it's a little bit more nuanced. Dwayne Johnson, um, in anticipation for this development agreement, the actual development um, coming to pass or, or coming to fruition, he understood that water would be a challenge, and so he went out and spent his own money, hard-earned money, um, to build tanks, wells, etc. I, I don't know all um, the details behind that, but, but that was because he knew he needed capacity for our 15-acre plot area plus the 100 the, ad the additional um, 85 acres that, that would come in the future. So that I, I appreciate Marjorie representing what she did. Um, I, I think it's fair to say that there has been an ongoing disputes or many disputes between um, our landowner partner and um, the Highland Water Company. I, I don't know the details. I'm not a party to that. But for those reasons, it's a little bit nuanced, more nuanced than it has been represented. Um, the infrastructure that has been constructed for Mountain Green Mutual, uh, it, it, it was initially, I think, intended to become a part of the Cottonwood system because that's kind of what had been done in the past. However, um, based on kind of recent political movement, um, they, there's been lack of cooperation uh, when it comes to having that infrastructure onboarded on the continent system. And I know they've been negotiating, and again, I'm not a party to that. I'm just representing Four Acres, the Lee's Marketplace project. Um, but, but that is ongoing. Um, so I guess I, I say all this just to represent that as a representative of Lee Market Marketplace, I appreciate everyone that's here. I, I, I hope that nobody feels that I'm trying to drive contention in any way. Um, I, I'm simply trying to represent the Badger family as best I can. And right now, um, th that entails asking for CMU blocking and continuing to pursue the optionality with 
either Cottonwood Mutual Water Company or Mountain Green Mutual Water Company. Um, and a lot of that's out of my control. Um, but, but the CMU blocking based on state code is within my control, and so I ask you to, I guess, reconsider. We're not going to ask for additional exceptions in the future. This is the extent of the request. And, and, and again, we, we've we invested a large amount of money in this, and so we, we get it more than anyone that this is, this is a very risky thing to do. Um, but, but kind of necessary because when a, when a grocery store wants to come into a market, there's a time period where it makes sense, and, 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 and that's why we requested the original at-risk permits to, to start so that next summer we can deliver the building and that the people of Mountain Green and Morgan County can benefit from, from that grocery store, that amenity. And that is the countervailing public interest that, that we provide or proposed. Um, again, I appreciate everybody. I, I, I apologize um, to any one of you if I've caused contention or problems, but, but um, it, it is a nuanced issue. Mountain Green, it's been, water's been an issue for a long time. I'm not the first person to stand up here and say, hey, um, Water is a struggle, it's a challenge, there's fighting, there's battles, there's everything. I'm sure there's lots of single family home members or single uh, residential homeowners that had to fight to get their water. Um, in most markets, you typically just go to a, a public works or a city and you'd pay them just a fee, a set fee. You wouldn't have to go source shares or pay for large infrastructure improvements, it's just a fee. So coming into Mountain Green, it's, it's a challenge. It's been a challenge for a long time. And I'm hoping that in the near future, it's resolved. But, but I guess that, that's all I wanted to say is the request for CMU Block is, is just to, to A, keep RNO on site because it costs a lot to remobilize for the developer, for the Badger family. Um, and, and B, just, just to rep rep represent to everybody why the selection for one of those two water companies has been made. Um, so I appreciate all of you guys, and, and if you have any more questions, have to answer. I, I do for you, Zach. Um, I have a little bit of concern with how many water lines we're going to have in Old Highway eventually. <laughs> There's not enough room, <laughs> to be honest. So it sounds like we currently have two water companies with water lines in that area, now potentially a third. Uh, that. That's a concern. Um, there's zero concern to me that CMU block will burn. Zero concern. So even though that's what we're discussing, I, th I think the valid point that Commissioner Fackrell has brought up is, is timing on this, on this new company. And when you couple that with an existing water company that has said, we will serve you, um, you guys have the rights to say, mm, we, we don't accept that or whatever you want to say. but. I think if you have somebody that can serve you, and, and as a owner, and I realize it's not you personally, but as an owner, you say, nah, I'm good. Well, how are you being served then? And, and we were told a month or two months ago that this company was being formed, and so we said, okay, that, that makes sense. I, I guess it really comes down to, do we have a timeline? And I guess the thought for me would be, we, we probably ought to have some kind of timeline and understanding and if that doesn't happen, then we've got a water company that will serve. So I, I, I guess I'm, it's still, it's kind of changed gears a little bit. I'm not, as far as the CMU is concerned, I, yeah, CMU won't burn. It's at risk, 100% at risk for you. So that, that's not an issue for me. What's an issue is that we, this continuation of, of where's the water going to, well, we know the water's going to come from, but this, this, that it's not. Do you have any kind of timeline on that, on that water company at all? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, the negotiation, there are negotiations currently between Conroe Mutual and Mountain Green Mutual um, for the potential conveyance of, of infrastructure um, to be able to serve a Lee's Marketplace project. Um, so that, that negotiation is ongoing. Um, as, as far as the DDW approval, I understand that it's extremely close, that they've satisfied most all um, of the requirements for that approval. Um, and that it's expected to be within the next month or so. Um, I, can't, I can't speak to um, the actual timeline. I, I, I don't represent the, the DW. Um, but what I will say is, is there were some concerns expressed 
uh, regarding Fireflow. Um, as as uh, marginally represented, there are lines from the tank to the site that are six inches, and I understand they do have plans to improve, improve those to, to increase that capacity. Um, I, I don't know when or how she says it's this next spring, uh, but that is a concern. But I guess the bigger concern that I would represent is um, when I had approached Highlands Water Company in the past. Um, again, our, our project is, is Lee's Marketplace, but it's a it's a six lot subdivision, and each one of those lots requires a wheel serve letter. Um, and when I had approached them in the past, that the the answer was. Yes, we'll service you. However, um, there's some conditions. Um, and again, I'm not going to go into that because it's not my place and I don't feel comfortable doing that. But but I can only represent my lot and I can't force my partner in the land to make certain exceptions or, or, or force his hand to do certain things um, on behalf of the project. I mean, again, it's the Mountain Green Village Development Agreement. It's 100 acres. And so there's a very nuanced, I guess, it's a lot more that's, that's going to be there eventually in that capacity. You, you kind of have to be married to the person you want to be married to, if that makes sense. Um, you, you need to know who you're working with and, and have a good working relationship. And so that, that's all I'll say on that. Okay, any additional questions for Zach? Thank you, Zach. Appreciate it. Josh. I'd just like to note that when they paid the fee for the at-risk permit, it was for the entire construction of the entire building, and they didn't hesitate to build that to pay that. So it wasn't an at-risk fee. It was the entire building permit fee. Good to know. Thank you. OK. So Garrett, with respect to an amendment of the previously passed ordinance under the state statute, then in order to move forward with this, we would have to propose an amendment or a new ordinance. That, that's my understanding. I, that's what I would suggest because I, I don't think it complies with the former ordinance. So we would have to notice it for that purpose. Correct. Assuming that the commissioners wanted to move forward with it in that way and that would give um you know me an opportunity to draft that ordinance and just make sure that the language is what we want it prior to the meeting so that that can go out and then we can just sign it and, and have it all set okay. so that means it'll go to the planning commission first or does it need to no it doesn't it, it just comes here it's not it's not a Morgan County code ordinance or, or it's it's not it, it's through the state code well hold on did we take it I don't think we took it before I can look into that too but I'm pretty sure under the state code it allows the land use authority which is the county commission to adopt an ordinance a temporary ordinance and so I'll confirm that as well I move that we postpone this decision um, to allow vertical any more until they get until we get the ordinance taken care of or the amendment to the other ordinance. So, can I make a comment to that? Sure. <laughs> yeah. I. I think I'm fine with this creating the amendment correctly, but it sounds like they're literally waiting right now to either continue building CMU or tell their guys to go home, and that will take another two weeks for us to get that posted correctly. So, but I don't know that we have any other choice. I mean, I don't know that we could allow anything without having the proper ordinance in place or or amended yeah I don't want the legalities problem so my question on the motion are you wanting to postpone or are you wanting to 
direct that the ordinance be prepared and be brought back for consideration in two weeks. That would be good. And then, but then it, they should not be going forward until the ordinance is done. That's just my thought. Yeah, I, I think that's understood by all that that wouldn't be able to move forward until. And that's why I that think it would correct? be appropriate to have the ordinance ready to go so that it can be signed and, and go into effect. Um, but yeah, it was noticed for a possible amendment to the scope of the Lee's Marketplace at risk building permit to allow. Um, it wasn't noticed for an amendment to the ordinance or a new ordinance. So I think that that's what Commissioner McConnell's point was, is that the reason to bring it back isn't just so we draft the ordinance, but I think a positive to postponing it as well as that the ordinance can be ready to go ahead of time and reviewed prior to the meeting. So I changed my, my <coughs> movement to do that or to reflect, reflect what Commissioner McConnell says because I think we need to have it in place before we... Yeah, and I, and I can appreciate that, but regardless, if we haven't noticed it, we can't we can't move forward on that action. We need to have the, the actual yeah, ordinance the actual in front ordinance. of us to, to move forward on that. And, and that, you know, please understand, that has nothing to do with our support of the project. Clearly, we support the project. That's why we're, we're even discussing this, I think, because we want to see it happen. Um, but we do have to abide by, by the code here, so. Yeah. Okay, so we have a motion. Do we have a second on the motion? Which motion are you looking at, Jerry? <laughs> well, your amended motion was to was to um, postpone it until we have prepare the ordinance. Prepare the ordinance for and so we discussion can, at the next meeting. That's right. Discussion and vote. And yes. Discussion. And well, don't we have to have a public hearing too? And then, so yeah, it would be that one. So public hearing, discussion, and vote. Yeah, I'll agree with that. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Thank you. Okay, we will move to item number three. Uh, discussion decision. Morgan Valley Arts Council request for risers and guardrail. Um, I will note that um, Mrs. Wright is not with us this evening. And um, at our last meeting, Commissioner Wilson was tasked with procuring some, some bids for this. Uh, he was able to get two bids, um, and those, those bids were sent to the commission previously. Did everybody have a chance to see those and review those bids? I did, but we also asked him to look into a trailer for it, and there was no bid on that either. He does not have a bid for that. He did in one of the emails. I thought he sent it to everyone, but perhaps he only sent it to me. He said that they did look into a good used trailer and they figured they could get something for below $5,000. They hadn't confirmed an exact trailer at this point. As far as the bids go, um, the original bid that we were provided is the low bid by, by quite a lot. Um, so that's still the, the uh, suggestion from his perspective. And I should note, Commissioner Wilson is out of town. That's why he's not with the city. I had, um, in fact, we all received the same email, I hope, I think, from an individual that says that we should not be spending money from the ramp tax for this arts. So that was the other question is, where are we going to take it from? I also sent out a reply to that to everybody. So you have that. And arts comes under recreation under the state statute under state statute too so and and i would just like a clarification of that because <clears throat> because ramp says recreation arts museums parks if it was approved specifically for recreation under the ramp tax wouldn't ramp in its name say that it excludes art so that that was just a question and and maybe there could be some discussion on that. Like, how do we know that recreation in the state code 
extends to the arts. Well, that all depends upon a judge that wants to rule on what is recreation and what is not. So, can I can I make a comment to this? Yeah. So, <laughs> versus going back and forth on the exacts and and how we're going to move forward, we we're all backing these mm -hmm. risers, and we're and we're going to do it. And I guess my suggestion might be if we do general fund now, and then we can figure out if in fact it would be pulled from ramp or not and why and why not but we're, we're backing what they're doing and we're all agreeing to what they're doing so if it's a concern of of what fund we need to pull from and, and why and what i think we'll get there um uh, my suggestion might be the general fund until we understand fully exactly how we'll spend that ramp tax suggestion I think that that's a better idea than pulling it because when I looked at the ordinance, because I got the same that you got, <clears throat> and the ordinance says for the limited purposes of recreational programs and facilities, which once again, on its face, it doesn't appear that arts would fall into that. Not that it couldn't fall into that, but just because RAMP stands for those four meanings and recreation is the first, arts is the second. And so I think that that gives us a chance to look at it, have the discussion, look at the code, and see if we just need to amend our ordinance before we could shift funds. So, I don't know that we need to. I mean, that's another discussion. Let's have that discussion next month. I'm. Not, I don't. And I'm not saying now, it needs to be had right now. I'm just yeah. saying that that makes more sense because I. I don't know that our code is clear that it can be used for arts, and I would rather well, amend the ordinance before. Um, the count, I, yeah, exactly, well, because the state code the allows code. The, the, the county to amend their ordinance and expand, but I don't know that our ordinance as it exists specifically identifies an ability to use it for the arts, and where there's that question, I think Commissioner Anderson's suggestion is, is prudent. Yeah, I, and I can agree, let's, let's go ahead and do it with a different from a different fund, but uh, I do want to have a further discussion on this ramp tax in January, okay? Yeah, I think if you want clarifications in the ordinance or to specifically expand it to include arts, I think that's a positive thing, so. Yeah, and the only thing I was saying was is recreation is any kind of leisure activity that gets us away from work and I know for you, it's get you away from it. And you love the arts, you love the music. Um, all of us in here enjoy the music. So if that's part of recreation, if that's your kind of recreation, because mine may be just plain old solitude up on the top of a mountain, that's a recreational activity. If recreation, if arts is part of recreation, then it needs to be part of that and it does say recreation limited uses actually it doesn't say limited it's just <laughs> anyway I sent that out to you before um, what it actually says and our employee also pointed that out too so I'm fine with this going with a different route and then we'll discuss this recreation and ramp tax next month so just one request for clarification on this so this is stated as a request for donation for risers and guardrails but are we planning to purchase them it sounds like as the county yeah we yeah. make them available to various organizations that, was that is correct because we can't do the donations like we have in the past according to the audit that we had last year we have to make exact so i can make a motion then okay go for it if you're ready for it. yes please so I make a motion that we approve the Morgan Valley Arts Council request that the county purchase the the risers you uh, and purchase them from the schools in organization. Looks like the total bid amount is twenty one thousand nine seventy four thirty six. Funds to be to come from the fund balance. I'll include in that motion an authorization, authorization to purchase um, a used trailer to store those facilities. I'll second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 
Any opposed? Okay, motion passes. Thank you. Okay, we have two more action items. However, we have noticed a budget hearing for 6 o'clock, and we are past the 6 o'clock hour. So um, I would like to move to the budget hearing and then come back for those action items if that's okay with the rest of the commission. All right. Um, in years past, we've had a little discussion about property taxes as part of our um, part of our budget discussion, um, and I'd like to do that again for the benefit of the public. So, um, we've got a very short presentation here to talk about property taxes. Um, did some comparisons of property taxes from previous years, etc. I'm going to go ahead and share that. Um, I think Jeremy's got that here, so we can do. That. Jeremy, are you able to change that over? He's working on it here. So we'll talk briefly about property taxes, how they're calculated. Oh, did it disconnect? Yep. Can definitely do that. Must have timed out on us. Use your error. Yeah, that too. <laughs> Okay, I'll try to be brief here. Commissioners, jump in if, if I miss anything. Does that sound good? Okay. And Leslie, you, you can keep me on track here as well. Um, some of you may have seen something very similar to this when we passed our budget last year and the year before we went through this. Um, two years ago, we had an increase, and, and so we went through in a little more detail. Um, but I just want to talk very briefly about property taxes, where they come from, and how they fund county government so um, when you as a landowner in Morgan County or in any any county in the state receive your property tax bill um, that property tax bill has multiple line items on it and when we talk about Morgan County specifically um, and the line items on your tax bill that pertain to Morgan County and that this body controls um, those are all of those line items that are listed at the top in red so that includes the county general fund, which is our largest line item, uh, Morgan County Capital Improvement Fund, County Library, Flood and Disaster Fund, and Health Services. All of the other line items that are listed below, which you may or may not have on your tax bill depending on where you live in the county. For example, if you live in Morgan City, they'll be included, but if you live in Mountain Green, you will have the Mountain Green Fire District and Sewer District rather than Morgan City. All of those other line items are controlled by other governing boards. So. School district, uh, school board controls the Morgan School District. Um, some of those are controlled by the state, so the state school basic levy. Uh, Weber Basin Water has their own governing board that controls their, their line item. Of course, Morgan City has their own city council that controls theirs. Mountain Green Fire District has their own, etc. So, when we talk about uh, budget for Morgan County, we're really talking about those top line items, but the, the line item that we really focus the most time and attention on is the general fund budget, and that's because that's the largest line item by far. Um, the Morgan County general fund property tax budget funds all of these essential um, items plus some, so fire and EMS, the sheriff's service, search and rescue, emergency management, parks, public works, all of the activities that take place within this building so our assessor our recorder clerk treasurer county commission county attorney planning and, and zoning department the dmv all of those are funded by the morgan county general fund um, it should be noted that the county general fund does not cover the total cost of any one of these departments in and of itself um, because in essence the county total general fund doesn't even cover the payroll for morgan county employees it, it's it's not quite enough to do that. So where do we get the rest of the money? Well, it's, it's through other sources, sales tax, fees, et cetera, that help cover that cost. So let's talk about how property taxes are calculated. 
Um, it's, it's a really pretty, pretty simple calculation, um, but it can become complicated. Um, essentially, you take the budget for the taxing entity, be it Morgan County, Morgan School Board, uh, Mountain Green Fire Protection District, and you divide it by the total taxable value of all of the real property within that district or within that county. Um, here's a very simple example, and this is of course assuming that every, every piece of property has the same value. You can see here, there's four little houses. If each one were worth 100,000, and I'm sure we all wish we could buy a $100,000 home in Morgan County these days, but um, let's just assume tough they shed. were. Tough shed. I don't know if you can even get a tough shed for that anymore. You can't get a tiny house for that. Um, assuming that your budget at the bottom there was $1,000, and that's the amount of money you need, and every property was worth the same amount, you would take that $1,000 and it would be divided by the total value of all those properties, which in this case would be $400,000, and you would get a rate. That rate in this case would be 0 0.0025, and that rate would be applied to each each. Uh, property, and then that's the tax that would be collected. Okay, so how does value affect the tax rate? Well, there's a few few ways in which it affects the tax rate. Um, if the budget remains the same, or if it does not increase at the same rate as the value increases, then the tax rate falls. If the budget increases, and values remain the same or only increase minimally, then the tax cr tax rate will increase. Right? Um, and I kind of like to look at it like a pie. So like pieces to a pie, if you assume the pie is the overall budget for whatever taxing entity, in this case we're talking about the Morgan County General Fund, um, every property owner is paying a piece of the pie. Uh, and that piece, the size of the piece of pie that you're paying for, depends on the value of your property, the property that you own. So when new growth um, or an increase in value occurs and the pie or the budget remains the same, then the piece that corresponds to a property owner gets smaller, right? Um, or if new growth occurs, one other way to look at that is now there's more people taking pieces of the pie, so your piece is going to become slightly smaller. So let's look at historical general tax fund rate. This was eye-opening to me as I put this together in the last couple of days. Um, these are the general fund tax rates as they have been uh, over the last several years, starting in 2018. So 2018 and 2022 were the last two tax increases that Morgan County um, went through with, I guess, adopted. Um, and you can see there's a proposed tax rate and then an actual tax rate. And the reason that there's a proposed and then an actual is because when we, when we determine that we're going to do an increase, that increase, we're, we're talking about that in fall of the year, we don't know what the total valuation is for all of the property until January 1 when those, those valuations are determined. Um, and even then, the assessor is determining the value of those properties as of January 1, they don't have that number on January 1st. So um, that's why there's a little difference there. But you can see here what the tax rate has done over the last little while. Um, so property values, it's, it's no secret, have increased. Um, that's not a Morgan County thing. That's a nationwide thing. Um, the, the average price of a new home, I think, in the United States now is, is nearly $400,000 across the whole country, which is... Um, considerably higher than it was just a few years ago. Um, in most years, our budget has remained the same. You can see 2019, 2020, 21, 23, and again in 24, our, our budget, we're not doing a budget increase. Our budget will increase slightly, and that's because of new growth. And of course, we're increasing because we're receiving increased sales tax and other, other sources of revenue, fees, et cetera. Um, but interestingly enough, the Morgan County General Fund tax rate fell from 2019 to 2023 almost 30 percent, uh, even though we had an increase in 2022. So how does this all calculate and how would it affect you as a, as a property owner? This is the 2023 actual numbers. So the general fund budget uh, for 2023 
the total amount that we we uh, hopefully have collected by now because taxes were due a few days ago was 3.4 million dollars and the total taxable property value for Morgan County so this is the taxable value if you have land in Greenbelt it's the taxable value if you uh, have a primary residence it's the taxable value which is 55 percent of the market value um, the total taxable property value for Morgan County was 2.2 billion dollars so to determine the rate we take that 3.4 million dollars we divide it by 2.2 billion dollars and that gives us a rate of 0 0.00154 and that was the rate that was applied on the property tax bill that you paid in November or sometime in 2023 again hopefully before now um, so what does that represent well for every hundred thousand dollars in valuation that's hundred and fifty four dollars that was was charged in property taxes and came to Morgan County so I put an example in here and last time I did this the example I used was a half million dollar home and when I did that there were people who said well good luck finding a half million dollar home in Morgan County anymore so I used an eight hundred thousand dollar home in this case to, to try to get a little more accurate so if you had a home uh, whose assessed value by the assessor was eight hundred thousand dollars and it was your primary residence you would be taxed on 55% of that, which is $440,000. So that would be the valuation, the tax value that's part of that $2.2 billion. Um, and that property, or that tax amount, 440,000 times the 0 .00154 uh, equals $677.60. So if you owned a uh, home worth $800,000 in 2023, you would have paid $677.60 to Morgan County to support all of those line items that we mentioned in the beginning. Now, something to note here. If you owned the same home and it had the same value in 2022, you would have paid $784 in property taxes for the exact same valued home for the same tax line item. And if you owned the same home in 2021 and it still had that $800,000 value, you would have paid $841. So um, the point I'm trying to make here is the property tax for the Morgan County General Fund has decreased year over year um, for the last several years and actually pretty considerably just in the last two years. Now. Here's the question that everybody's going to ask, right? Well, if county general fund rate has decreased, why have my property taxes increased? Because I guarantee everyone who opened their property tax statement this year probably had a little bit of sticker shock because it was more than last year and certainly more than the year before. Well, it increased, your property taxes increased for a couple of reasons. Number one, your valuation likely increased. Again, the valuation is determined by the assessor, but the valuation is based on, on appraisals of actual sales within the county. So some people say, well, I'm mad at the appraiser because she assessed my home at a high value. Well, the appraiser is not the person to be mad at. It's your next door neighbor who sold their house for $800,000, and now yours is worth that, right? Because the value is whatever somebody's willing to pay for it. So um, likely your value increased, and, and maybe it's because it was assessed at a little higher value perhaps you also did something to your home to create more value you know I, a couple of years ago i added a barn that increased the value um, a few years before that i i added an addition to my home and that increased the value so there may be things that you've done that that have increased the value to your home as well um, and then the other reason why your property taxes have increased is that other taxing entities have increased their budgets and when they increase their budgets even if the rate falls, if they increase their budget, that is, is a tax increase um, and, and you end up paying more. So that's the overall how property taxes are calculated, why we have to go through this whole um, process. And, and ultimately, those property taxes for the county general fund are what support Morgan County and our operations here. So. Um, commissioners, did I leave anything out you'd like to share with the general public? 
Yeah, I'm, I'm going to add. Sorry, Commissioner Falker, I saw you getting ready. Yeah, I'm getting ready, but that's okay. I guess I'm going to add. There's a lot of information, and, and I think if somebody's trying to follow it, it, it can be a little bit difficult. I guess for me what's extremely simple is if I've been in the same house in 2021 and in 2022 and now 2023, um, how much am I paying more? Uh, I know there's tax rates go up and down. I know evaluations can go up. They can go down, actually. But my biggest concern is this upcoming year, am I going to have to pay more taxes or am I not going to have to pay more taxes? That's really what it comes down to for me. So the good news is for Morgan County General Fund, we are not doing a tax increase this year. Um, so the rate will fall as valuations will rise, I, I, I assume, based on the market, um, which means your rate will fall. Will you pay more? Perhaps, because your valuation may go up, and that, that may affect your overall tax bill. Um, unfortunately, that's the market right now, and it's, it's very difficult. In fact, it's, it's rising at such a breakneck speed that it's, it's kind of difficult to, I think, even for the assessor to keep up which is partly why I think some have seen some fairly large increases in valuation over the last few years. Yeah, I was just going to say that <clears throat> if you look at the amount that we bring in on that general fund, that is only one-third of the budget. <clears throat> we collect two-thirds of the budget in other ways. <clears throat> and those are not just paid by us as residents they're paid by anybody that comes to this valley and buys something so there's a lot that and also for those companies that may be in business in our county that go and sell products outside of this county so there's a lot of things that go into the revenue that comes into the county and um, like i say it equals up to about two-thirds of the bus two-thirds of the budget so we, we can be thankful for that, and that's what we're working on in economic development. I think that's a good plug for buy local, um, because all the sales tax, not all the sales tax, but sales tax that is collected in Morgan County helps us avoid a property tax increase. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to buy it anyway, buy it in Morgan County. We, we prefer that if you can. Um, I, I think that's another reason why we support local business and we support new businesses coming to the county because we love to see that, that opportunity for the sales tax revenue to help offset the costs when it comes to property tax. So, All right. With that, I think we'll turn it over to Leslie to go through our 2024 uh, budget. While she's coming up, I, I want to make mention of the hours and hours and hours that go into a budget process for the county. Um, this year is the, I guess, fifth or sixth time that I've sat through the budget process. Um, and it's, it's a lengthy process. There's a lot that goes into it. Every department head, every elected official within the county puts a lot of effort into the budget process. And the commission spends a lot of time, in some time, some cases, agonizing over um, what we can or can't afford, or how we should or should not use the funds. Um, but I hope that ultimately the public understands that we take this very, very seriously. And while it may seem simple in this meeting that we that we approve a budget, we've been working on this budget really all year, but in earnest since September. Um, we've had weeks where almost every night we spend hours and hours here discussing the budget and talking through every single line item. Um, so I, I'm really proud of all the work that's gone into it. I want to thank Leslie and, and her office for all the work that goes into it, Julie as well, for all the work, um, and, and our treasurer, uh, Kimberly, who also sat through all those budget sessions um, because it, it's, it's really a major uh, labor to get to this point. So with that, Leslie, I'll turn it to you. Thank you. So our budget's going to be as, as the following. Um, our general fund is going to be 10,899,731. Our class B road fund will be $650,912. 
Our flood disaster fund will be $27,167. Our health services fund will be $236,795. Our mineral lease fund, <coughs> excuse me, will be $8,390. Our library fund will be $327,000. $327,000. Um, our impact fee fund will be $283,415. Our corridor preservation will be $135,000. Recreation fund will be $377,000. The fair fund will be $237,610. Economic development will be $200,000. Tourism will be $558,000. Capital projects will be $146,322. Our enterprise fund, which is our garbage fund, which will be $770,500. And our lease revenue bond, which is the Mountain Green Fire Station, will be $15,450 for a total of $14,919,150. Thank you, Leslie. Commissioners, are there any questions on the budget, the 2024 budget? No, but I'll make a motion that we open the public hearing. Thank you. We have a motion to open the public hearing. Do we have a second? Second. A motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, motion passes. We are now in public hearing regarding the 2024 Morgan County budget. Tina Kelly, Mountain Green. I just wanted to say thank you put for the, all the hard put, work. Put the mic down. <laughs> there you go. Thank you. Just wanted to say thank you for all the hard work. I understand as much as you do about the budget, and I appreciate the explanation that Commissioner Newton just went through for the public, because I think that there is a lack of understanding sometimes, and it helps to be able to have that outlined that way. And I appreciate the hours and hours that you put in, and the discussions on whether or not you should spend the money and how you should how you should spend the different funds. I did want to say this time I really appreciated when I got my tax bill, the work that Kimberly did on the pie chart, because that more than anything, that goes out to every taxpayer, that more than anything lets you see where that tax distribution goes and where the increases are. So I just wanted to say that thank you and thank all of the staff because they've all worked so Thanks. Thank you, Tina. Okay, seeing no additional public comment, I'll look for a motion to adjourn the public hearing and reconvene the public meeting. So moved. Mm -hmm. <laughs> second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, motion passes. We are now back in the public hearing and are not I look hearing. for a motion regarding resolution CR 23-15. Mr. Chair, I'll make a motion that we approve resolution CR-23-15, a resolution of the Board of County Commissioners of Morgan County adopting the operating and capital budgets of Morgan County for the 2024 calendar year. I'll second it. A motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Thank you again. Okay, we will go back to our action items. Um, we are on number four, action item number four. <coughs> Commissioner Anderson. And, and Josh. Thank Josh. You. Thanks. <coughs> I've been meeting with uh, representatives of uh, the Department of Wildlife Resources in Summit County um, to talk about the grant opportunity to study dangerous transportation corridors with regards to wildlife. Um, I sent each of the commissioners copies of the maps that I was provided, which showed the number of uh, traffic accidents uh, that have occurred between Peterson and Echo Junction, um, Echo Canyon area. Um, the, the grant itself, uh, the expiration date was actually prior to uh, December 7th, but because of the lack of uh, applicants, uh, they extended it, and so the application uh, do this uh, December 7th. Um, Summit County 
uh, DWR, uh, DWR wanted to collaborate with uh, jurisdictions. And since um, the route between um, Peterson and uh, Echo, uh, Echo Junction falls within Summit County as well as Morgan County, uh, they reached out to us and um, um, Summit County has agreed to provide uh, $3,500 towards the match. Uh, DWR has said that they would backfill the remaining portion that um, Summit County and we do not provide. The amount of money that's being requested is $186,000 uh, and change. Um, the match is 6.75%, which is roughly $13,860. Um, the, uh, the grant itself can't pay for the construction of the infrastructure, but it'll pay for the studies and the plans that, um, to prepare for future construction uh, for uh, wildlife crossings um, and other safety uh, ways to, to prevent the accidents. Um, I said that I would bring this before you and ask if there's an amount that you'd be willing to provide um, as part of that. I um, just want to make a quick comment. I appreciate Josh jumping on this. I got the call when I was down at UAC in St. George and called up Josh, and um, he jumped jumped right on it and, and even met. Was it the next day you went up to Summit County and met with this group? Oh, um, we met over Zoom. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so I met with them on Friday uh, over Zoom, and then we had another meeting last week to kind of go over the draft of the document, which DWR said that they would provide. Um, Morgan County will be the... Um, the main lead on on the project with Summit County and uh, DWR providing kind of a, a yeah, at least for this feasibility. I know if Summit County put in thirty five hundred, um, I think if we were to considering that the distance of roadway might be fairly similar, if we were to put in thirty five hundred, that the calculation I did is one point eight percent match, which I think is a pretty big steal of a deal. Um, to be able to put that kind of money in and get get a grant that'll cover the rest to, to address the, the wildlife crossings. Do you feel like that'll be sufficient to show our commitment to it? I, I think so, especially with Summit consider County. Do a higher amount, or do you feel like that's sufficient? I, I think with Summit County submitting the same, or submitting that amount, and then letting DWR um, finish the rest, we would be equal to what they're submitting. I, I, that's my thoughts. Have you had any other thoughts talking with them? No, I would agree with you. Um, DWR has already said that they'll backfill the amount, and if we match what some county matches, then it brings down the, what DWR would have to provide. Okay. If you want to provide more, I don't think they'll say no, but... <laughs> <coughs> you know, we could use the money that they give us every year for that uh, grant, or not grant, but for... Anyway, it's about like $3,800 if you wanted to use that. I don't know which one that is. It's the one that you bring in every year for us. Oh, yeah. Um, still wait, there. are you talking about the, the Predator? Not the yeah. Predator one, the other one. They just bring us a check every year. They have that. Oh, it's the PILT payment. It's not the PILT payment. Yeah, it's, 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 it's not payment the in lieu of taxes right, for the, for for the, the ground state. that they yeah. own. Okay. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Yeah, and you're right, it's about that amount. I mean, it, that goes into the general fund, so I, I would say we just take this from the general fund, and all right, we can right. assume that that's helping replenish that. But, yeah, you're right. We do get that bill payment. So, do we have a motion, then, on this item? Go ahead. I'll make a motion that we... Uh, how did we... Let me make sure I can word this right. That we... How we, is there an agreement with DWR before I make that motion, Josh, or how would we do this? Because they... Uh, that's a question I don't have an answer for. I know the application needs to be sent in. We're a signatory on the application. Um, I'm not sure how the match is. I think it would be more of a letter. So maybe contribute. Maybe just, I'll use that Yeah. Word. So make a motion. to the contribution at this point, probably. Yeah. Make a motion that we... Um, contribute $3,500 to the DWR collaboration grant um, coming from the the PILP payment. Or just the general fund. Or the general yeah, fund. General fund, fund general fund coming from the general fund balance. I'll second it. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor? 
Hi. 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 Um, yep. there was, I'm sorry. There was one other item. It wasn't related to the funding. Um, DWR is asking, and I think I sent out an email requesting um, whether you'd be willing to either prepare a letter of support to go with the application or if you'd like to sign on to the letter that was already prepared. Which do you feel will be more effective? I think if it's a personal letter from the commission, I think that would go a lot further than just a co signer on it. So, Josh, maybe if you're okay with this chair, I'll just work with you on that and we'll get that letter ready Great. for you to sign on. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Uh, last action item here, item number five. Uh, Robert and Josh, this is discussion. Uh, decision, Oregon County Ordinance of Protection of Public Drinking Water Sources. Sorry, I'm going to hand this over to Robert. I know Josh isn't real familiar with this, but I think he'll become familiar very soon. So state law requires first and second council class counties to have a protection of public drinking water source ordinance in place. It's not required for rural counties, but a number of them have imposed this type of an ordinance. I've sent you an early draft. I then amended and modified it to apply. Well, first of all, I worked with the Division of Drinking Water to make sure that they um, were comfortable with the form of ordinance. Um, they made some recommendations, so those were included the changes that I sent. And the other thing that I asked them was, can we just have this apply within the zones of the county that it seems most applicable, which would be the residential zones, the commercial zones, and the industrial zones. And when I say the most applicable, I mean that the prohibited activities shouldn't be really on, going on in those areas anyway. The one exception to that is septic tanks, because we do have residential zones where septic tanks are allowed. Um, and for that reason, there is a um, a grandfathering clause that essentially allows existing septic tank systems to be um, continue in use. The, the issue that it resolves is when water companies identify new sources of water, whether they're wells or springs or otherwise, there are zone one and zone two protection zones. Um, there's also zone three and four, and working with the division, they said we didn't need to do the three and four, so that's why the the last one I proposed to pull those out. Um, and you need to go get agreements from landowners with respect to those. One of the things that was interesting to me, though, is if you identify an initial water source and there's an initial zone one and zone two protection source that's provided based upon the proposed flow from that well, that's, where they, that's what they use in order to impose the protection source requirement. But if that well ends up to be a higher producing well than anticipated, they don't make anyone go get the additional um, protections that would be needed. And so I thought that was actually kind of an inconsistent application of the policy. So this would be beneficial from my perspective to all of the water companies. The only additional thing that I would say that we could um, discuss is whether we want to have a general exception for areas that are not served by a public water company. So, and, and then it wouldn't apply to rural residential areas where there is no public water provider in that area. And what I'd like to request is that this be considered by the Planning Commission for recommendation and brought back to us as soon as possible. Yeah. Go ahead, Jerry. Commissioner McConnell, I've got a few questions. Um, so, um, if an individual, and maybe I might be understanding this wrong, but um, if, if I come in and propose a development and, and there's an existing water company that will serve me and give me a will serve, um, it's their responsibility on where, whether they have wellheads or wherever they get their water source from, um, and they have to prove it to the state that, that they've done that process correctly, I, I believe. <laughs> yes. And then um, if I come in as and buy a 
um, let's still say it's a subdivision, but it's a acre and a half lot on Old Highway Road out in the middle of nowhere. And I come in and say, well, I got to get water. Well, your only way you can do that is by drilling a well. And um, that's acceptable. You have to get your, you have to lease the water through, um, apply to um, Weaver Basin Water and, and lease whatever amount through them. Um, are we, by, by proposing this, are we in line, I guess, with what the water companies out there and the water districts out there are requiring also? Are we in line? Are we overstepping? Are there two different regulatory agencies here? I mean, I just want to make sure. I'm so I think you're talking about two different things. If you're rural residential, there's no public water provider. And so you're going to provide your own water source by putting a well into your own property uh, and then having a septic system as well. The septic system is regulated by the Department of Health. They'll want it to be a certain distance away from your well. You probably want it to be a certain distance away from your well as well. And, and um, depth. <laughs> and, and so this ordinance wouldn't be applicable to them at all because this only relates to properties served by a public water system. Now, in terms of your, the other part of your example, if the subdivider is putting in property and having it served by a public uh, water provider, it may or may not be within a well protection area. And the, the um, provider could say, if it was within a well protection area, I will provide service, but we want the um, the agreement, the land use agreement, in place in order to do it. This would say you don't need the land use agreement because the county's already regulating in that space and saying you can't you can't have the pollution sources that are identified in the code. So and those pollution sources are like extremely hazardous materials, sanitary landfills. Um, feeding lots. Again, I, I don't see those as appropriate uses in those zones. So, so if we, if uh, we sorry, go ahead. Back, if we enact this, then are there any existing wells with water companies where are they all um, in compliance with what we're proposing? Do we think there's some of them that might not be? How, is, how would that work? Th they wouldn't be out of compliance. This would provide drinking water source protection to them that they don't currently have by agreement. So for example, the Highlands Water Company has a well down on the Johnson property. And it's, what's it called? Oh, the UDOT property now. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Um, and they have some source protection agreements in place, but their zone two extends way up into Rollins Ranch, if I, I've got the map. I doubt they have those from the individual lot owners up there. So this would put that protection in place for them with, with or without the letter. And then that satisfies a division of drinking water requirement with respect to it. So how does that work? Um, and I know in the area that we're really concerned about is the Mountain Green area. Um, and those two wells, one for the Highlands and one for Dwayne Johnson, you've got agriculture around it currently. It's going to become a town center eventually, but for now, how does that protect the agriculture and also protect the wells? That's why the second or third version of the ordinance that I sent you only applied it in the residential, commercial, and industrial zones. And I, the reason I didn't include that originally is because I hadn't talked to the Division of Drinking Water about that, and I wanted to make sure that from their perspective that was fine to just apply it. Because most of the ones that I read, all the other counties, were on a countywide basis. And so I wanted to talk to them about whether or not that was an acceptable way. And they said, yeah, you get to regulate it the way you want to regulate it. If you want to carve that out, then you can carve that out. And what would happen is if a public water provider was putting in a well and a portion of it went into the agricultural area, then 
they would have to still get the agreement from the agricultural user or get an exemption if they can't get it. And with respect to the rural, the residentially zoned area, then this would be in place. So uh, the 250 day groundwater time, is that from? That's in zone three and four, and the updated version of the ordinance that I sent to you deleted yeah. it. Well, this, this one here is zone two. Oh, let's look at it. Okay, so zone two. So that's a calculation made by the engineers. Okay. And so if that zone two, to, to go back to your the same question, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. If, so let me just show you one on. Okay. If I knew how to put it up there, I'd put it up there. You can. I just. So this is the Highlands Well on the U dot property. You can see Zone One is the little tiny circle around it. Zone Two is a calculated protection area worked out by their engineers and the state as to what that protection area is and you see it extends up in here into the Rollins Ranch subdivision. This well is a cottonwood well and small area. You see how their zone two is much smaller? That's because of the production capacity of that well. And so the other one down here, Dwayne Johnson's, okay, that's so small. That one's not Dwayne Johnson's oh, well. I that one's that not on here. Oh, okay. I thought it was. Okay. All right. So this is to go to the Planning Commission now for them to review it, and then it will come back to us to approve. Yeah, so I looked at this as a public health and safety ordinance, but it seemed to me that it had a land use element by state statute, and so I do believe we should send it to the Planning Commission for the recommendation. Um, I, I would really like to see as part of this process that we make sure to send some type of a notification to, to our contacts at every one of the current water systems within the county because I'd like to just get their feedback on you know, how they see this as affecting them and help educate them if, if there are concerns. Now, I don't know at what point we need to do that. You know, I don't know if that, that should probably be done um, maybe dare I say midway through the process because I don't want to send out and say we're thinking of doing this and then come to find out there's a lot of things in that we may or may not do I think when we have a substantially ready it would be good to at least discuss that with with those system operators and understand if you know they're in agreement or if they have concerns so we can address them before we fully adopt it we're not required to send those notices but I don't have any objection to doing so So I don't know if that requires a motion or is it just no. a recommendation to go to the Planning Commission and have them bring it back as soon as possible? I think you might as well just do it as a motion. I think it just says that you direct staff, or, so maybe not a motion, but just a direction to staff to prepare it and through. I'll, I'll make a motion that we direct the staff. Just to a second before you do. A question then, as far as these protection zones within the county, it says RR10, RR5, RR1, they're already in that zone one, is that correct? Completely different concepts. Zone one is just an area around the well. Okay. Those references are to our land use code and the applicable zones where this ordinance would be applicable. Okay, all right, go ahead. So I'll make a motion that we direct the staff to prepare and present to the Planning Commission for recommendation to the County Commission uh, the county ordinance for the protection of public drinking water sources. Second. Motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, motion passes. All right, that brings us to the end of our action items. We'll move to Commissioner comments. Um, I just wanted to make mention of the uh, Christmas on Commercial Street event that took place this last weekend. Um, uh, although the, the county doesn't directly uh, sponsor or support that event, 
the, the Chamber of Commerce does that and they did a, a fantastic job. It was well attended and, and I think it's really a, a great activity. So appreciate the work that went into that and all those who did participate. Um, I'll give just a brief update on the Croydon Bridge project. It, it is moving forward um, at a much quicker speed than we saw last year, or at least it's more visible. Uh, looks like the deck to the bridge is, is on or, or nearly on, um, and they are on schedule. So that's moving forward as planned. Um, I think we're to the point now that we're out of the woods on the water situation as well, so if they need to let more water out, I think we're in good shape now, so that's good. Uh, that is all that I had for this evening, Commissioner Fackrell. Um, I just want to comment on the chamber and their Christmas on Commercial Street. That was a good event, even with the ice cold ice cream that Mike <laughs> says you've got ice cream in your hand no matter where you're at. <laughs> uh, it was great. In fact, I had some people up there from out of town that said this is an excellent, excellent project that you do every year um, and we ought to be promoting it so that way people will come and enjoy. I am kind of disappointed that we didn't have more community members there. Uh, it was not as crowded as normal and it was a better day and some people said well, this is like a Hallmark movie <laughs> because it was just the, the light snow coming down and you know it was, it was pretty nice. Um, also, I met with uh, Representative Moore and in uh, a meeting a week or so ago, and he was telling us some of the things that are happening in Washington and his role, and he is now the vice chair of, the, of some kind of the committee, the Republican-led committee. I guess that's what it's called, isn't it? Um, but anyway. For various committees in Congress. Yeah. Anyways, he's um, right near the Speaker of the House, and uh, anyway, it was a very good thing, and concerns we have, he's, he was, we gave them to him, some of them was affordable housing, and uh, some of the mandates, and the infrastructure bills, and controlling the budget and uh, the, whatever you call it, the thing that's coming up in January or February, the budget, you know, if they don't pass the budget, they decide to do it this year as, a, as, a, as the Republicans and the whole House decided instead of holding it up hostage in December just before Christmas, they would do it later on in the year. So, you know, it was a nice uh, gesture that they did. Uh, which is nice. Now let's just see him do it, take care of it. Um, other than that, I think we had a event last night with you guys and the Squire. Yeah, are you ready? For no, I'm, uh, yeah, go ahead. So yeah, the Morgan Community Choir concert was last night. Um, and it was reasonably well attended as well. Um, but it was, I think it went well. I sounded good to me from where I was standing. <laughs> I was on those narrow risers. Uh, the, the new ones will be nice, more for the Messiah than for this one, just because the Messiah you can, is longer and you can sit until you are called upon to sing. The attendance is an interesting thing. I went last Saturday night to the Pops concert at Cottonwood High School. Much bigger auditorium, advertised on KUTV. It was the Morgan, or not the Morgan, what are they called? The Salt Lake Chamber Chorus Society, the Madrigal Society from Cottonwood High School, the West Valley Symphony, and a professional uh, female solo soprano. And the main part of their auditorium was pretty filled, but the sides were not, and they, they actually have a balcony as well and just very few people in the balcony and I thought you know this is kind of advertised on a, a, a television news station the participants in it were ten times what we have in our little choir and so it made me feel better about the relatively small 
size that we have at some of our events. But to the extent you can go to those things and support them, it's great entertainment at a local level. Um, the Messiah concert is on the 17th, um, and it's a great way, way to celebrate the season. Um, the Family Support Center, YCC, is moving forward on their project, doing really well that way. Um, I'm waiting for some uh, recommendations from the airport manager um, with respect to a grant request uh, for improvements at the airport. That's all I have. Thank you, Commissioner McConnell. Commissioner Anderson. Uh, just a couple comments. Um, Commissioner Facco and I um, attended both RPO and the COG meeting and just want to give a quick public comment to our OP RPO committee and our regional planning. We really um, have helped create mechanisms for us to determine which projects receive money in COG better than what we've had in the past. In fact, we kind of haven't had anything in the past, so they've set up something to submit to COG group. COG group will look at that and approve that. And of course, as you guys know, the tax dollars that comes through COG They'll give their recommendations of which projects they'll, they'll use those on to the commission for approval. So it's just a, it's a process that's getting much cleaner, and it was just good to see that that process was getting cleaner than what it has been. Um, the other comment, um, also with Commissioner Facco, you can get around a lot, but um, we were we attended a um, Association of Commissioners, Utah Association of Commissioners meeting. And it was, it was a good meeting. Um, they wanted to receive comments for what to um, take to the legislature this year. I think one of the main underlying thoughts, and we'll give updates starting next month, as, as many as we will get a lot of them, so we'll be giving a lot of updates, but I think one of the bigger concerns is when there's state mandates for counties to do um, whatever the mandate is that we need to do that that they have associated funds that we can perform that mandate. I think there's a lot of struggles when they say, hey, counties, we need you to do this. Good luck finding the money to do it, but, but you're required to do this. So we're a lot of work going on, a lot of laws happening, and we'll, we'll keep everybody updated. So those are the comments I've got. Have you any, any of you heard about the SB 174 recommendations from UAC? I, I attended the presentation they did on that and they talked about doing a simple form of ordinance that simply updates to say that our ordinances shall comply with essentially the SB 174 requirements and, and, and putting that in as a stop gap until you can go through the whole county land use code to determine what changes are required to accommodate SB 174. Have you heard anything on that? I haven't I'll, heard I'll follow up with that then. That's another one we'll have to recommend to the Planning Commission to get to us quickly. Okay. Yeah, I'm not familiar with that one, so it'll be good to learn about. It essentially imposes time requirements with respect to plat approvals and oh, review okay. process. Much like they did a few years ago on the building permit process. Yes. Right. Can I add one more thing? Sure. You sure? <laughs> If it's just one. <laughs> <laughs> Have either of you or any of you, um, I just want to know whether or not we should go further. Um, Jared and I and Mike uh, talked to some about an inland port authority. Do we want to continue that conversation with them in our area or not? I think it would at least a at conversation. Least hear what they have to say. I agree. Okay. Jared, did you want to do it or you want me to? Yes. Okay, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. With that. Oh, um, and can we, we go into... Yes. Do you want to make that motion? Sure. I move that we go into a closed session to for the purpose of litigation and property disposition. And what's the personnel one? Character and professional competence. Professional competence of an individual. For me. Okay. I'll second. A motion, a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.
Any opposed? Okay, motion passes.